our next speaker today is um, um, Tiziana Pace, who is IH Milan's Young Learners Coordinator. Um, and along with her duties as coordinator, Tiziana is also a trainer on our um, IH Very Young Learners course. And today she's going to be talking to us about um, soft skills in the primary classroom. So I'm going to turn myself off, Tiziana, and it's over to you. Thank you. All right. So thinking about the topic for this year conference, I started looking back at what has happened in the past few months. And as many of you will know, 2020 has been an odd school year, to put it mildly. So first of all, I'd like you to think about some of the challenges we've faced this year and write some keywords in the chat box. Let's see. What are the challenges we face? It was stressful, yes. <laughs> Technology, patience, yeah. Uncertainty, exactly. So here are some of the challenges we faced at IH Milan. However, there is a catchphrase that has become more and more important lately, and that kept being in my head. And this is soft skill, which is what I'd like to focus on today. So today, we're gonna have a look at what they are, see how they can be developed, reflect on our role as educators, and share some practical ideas. First of all, let's start with the definition of soft skills. Have a look at how two institutions describe them. So basically, soft skills are those abilities that help promote mental well being and competence in young people as they face the reality of life. As we'll see, they are a wide range of skills. They're not specific to any area of life. They've become increasingly relevant and they are now recognized as essential. So that they've also been included in many educational frameworks. Many of these skills are not new. Concepts such as communication, collaboration, critical thinking, they've existed for a long time. And they are often described as opposed to hard skills. And this is our starting point today. So have a look at these skills. Some of these are labeled as hard skills and others are what we call soft skills. Take a moment to think about which one is which. And here is how they are grouped. So hard skills are measurable. They're easily defined, they're specific. They are the technical knowledge gained through any life experience, including education and career. But whether or not you are successful in your career may depend on the soft skills. These go hand in hand with the knowledge and the ability to do the job well, but they are hard to measure. They're difficult to define. They're universal and related to personal and interpersonal competencies. So soft skills are the ones that help us get along with others be prepared for the future and have the ability to be flexible and make good decisions. That said, I've got a question for you. Can soft skills be learned? You can write in the chat box. What do you think? Yes, absolutely. 
They can't be learned. They can be improved. Okay. Well, yes. The good news is that we can learn and develop soft skills as well as we do with hard skills. The bad news though, is that often it's much harder to do so. And there's no easy measure of success. So if we agree that they can be learned, can they be taught? What do you think? Yes, yes, great. So we agree on this. Yes, they can be taught. The bad news is they cannot be taught from a textbook and there's no formal assessment of them. The good news is that they can be easily integrated in our teaching practices in a principled and effective manner so that they can be accessible to all learners, whatever their educational context. And where are we in all this? What's our role? Well, I think that teachers can make a difference. First of all, because school should be a place where students are prepared for life and soft skills are life skills. So how will students be ready for life without the skills required of them being taught in schools? Second, teachers can have a huge impact on the future of the students. We are educators and we should be aware of our role in students' lives. Also, the activities we design should take into account the learning and development of the old child rather than simply provide a series of recipes for narrowly focused practice. And there's more. Soft skills are already used in the classroom when teachers model appropriate behaviors. And while all teachers can incorporate soft skills into their lessons, language teachers are especially well-placed to do so. ELT methodologies may already involve aspects of soft skills, such as communication, collaboration, intercultural competence. So many features of the communicative language teaching are suitable for the development of soft skills. And the two goals can be achieved together in an integrated way. So back to our soft skills. These, of course, are only some examples there are many more, but today we'll focus on these four, which are called the four C's. Let's start with creativity. Creativity is the ability of thinking flexibly to generate new ideas and solutions to problems. It is, in other words, what we call thinking outside the box. It leads to various interpretations and responses to issues, to topics and to challenges. And it can be found in our language teaching materials because they already bring some creativity into the classroom. Our role is just to maximize on the activities proposed. And we can do it by nurturing a climate of creativity, experimentation, providing opportunities for learners to share personal experience, creating multimodal outputs, giving opportunity to draw, dance, play, sing, especially to younger students, and setting tasks that allow for multiple responses. So creativity should always be encouraging students, although it might sometimes lead to unexpected outcomes. So here you can see how the teacher role is essential. So which activities can encourage creativity then? Brainstorming and accepting different ideas, even if they are less conventional, as long as they're appropriate. Project work 
encouraging students to be creative with colors, with visuals. For example, we could challenge students to be able to recognize their work with no name on them. Songs, changing the lyrics, adding gestures, stories, writing a different ending for the stories, and role plays. So the pretending to be someone else. Now, let's have a look at some tasks. First of all, we'll start with a comparison. Here we have two different activities with the same language aim. We're practicing the past simple. Which one do you think enables the students to be more creative? The one on the right or the one on the left? Let's see, you can just try right or left. Yeah, we all agree is one on the right. Why? Because the activity on the left has got just one correct answer, whereas the one on the right elicits the same language while opening up opportunities for interpretation. It provides students with opportunities to be creative. Another example, drawing dictation. I'll leave you a moment to read it. So this activity gives the opportunity to draw and color, which is what children love. But it's also meaningful. It's got a language aim. So students are not just coloring a worksheet. And last but not least, it's doable online. We can do it on platform like Zoom that enables the breakout rooms. If not, the teacher can be describing the object and the students can all be drawing at the same time. Next one, unusual uses. Here, children have to brainstorm as many unusual uses of an object, and they win if they're more than the other team, but the uses must be unusual. And the objects don't have to be complicated. On the contrary, the simpler the objects, the more challenging the task. You can use things such as a chair or a paper clip. This task enhances team working and it's useful to practice the infinitive of purpose because we can drill and model sentences such as it can be used to. Now let's try. In the chat box, can you write some unusual uses of a paper clip? What could it be used for? Open a lock, yeah. Make a snake, great. As a hairpin, yes. Change, change SIM cards on the phone, yes, correct. Okay, a fishing hook. Exactly. So here we are thinking about creative uses for such a common object. Let's move on to critical thinking. Critical thinking is a natural partner of creativity because it requires a creative mindset to think outside the box and look at things differently. It refers to the ability to analyze information and draw on problem solving skills to form a balanced judgment. It includes the ability to evaluate the source and accuracy of information found online or offline, which is an important skill now more than ever. So how can we encourage students critical thinking? By nurturing curiosity in them by letting them create their own task, 
by providing chances for personalization, not intervening immediately. And by this, I mean giving them some thinking time and avoiding spoon-fed answers. Asking open-ended questions, the famous why. We can do this with tasks such as describing a picture. And here, all the power is in the image we pick. For example, what can you see in this picture? Just write some keywords. What can you see? Football fans, joy, yes, tribes, okay. And what is missing in this picture? What, what's missing? Girls, yes. Girls are missing. So using such a picture in the classroom can allow children to think critically to what they're exposed to every day. Other examples are decision-making activities, discussions, predictions, personalization. Okay, let's start with a team decision-making activity. Quite straightforward. You describe a scenario, for example, you're going on a camping trip and you set the decision to make. You can only take five objects with you. And again, it doesn't need to be complicated. You could work with what's already in our textbook. Here you have an example. This task reinforces vocabulary in context and it also encourages students to give reasons for their choices. Also, another task for critical thinking, what is it made of? Which is a simple table with different materials on the left and some objects at the top. Students have to think about the objects and tick the right box. In this case as well, there are different possible answers. Think about a box. It can be made of metal, plastic, and even wood. Also, students are encouraged to think about their answers. And it's open to personalization, because as you can see, students can choose two objects to describe. One last task to develop critical thinking, the odd one out. We choose some words, we write them on the, word, on the board, and students have to tell us which one does not belong to the group, giving reasons for that. This is a common activity that students like, and it allows them to give different answers. Because as you can see here, I would say the line is different because a cake, an orange, and pizza are round and a lion is not. It is useful for exam preparation. It is actually one of the tasks of the Cambridge Movers exam. And it's adaptable because we can work with vocabulary our students already know, and we can make it a bit more difficult. Let's try it with you. Which one is the, the odd one out among the words you can see now? Which one does not belong to the group and why? Window, can you tell me why the window? It has no legs, great, yes. Any other ideas? Because as we saw, there are different possible answers. A window is different because it's the only object we kind of put things on. Shelf, you can't sit on a shelf. Yes, exactly. So here is a bit more challenging because 
the words are all related to the owls somehow. But we still have to think about one reason. Okay. Moving to communication. As language teachers, we usually focus on announcing our students' ability to speak and write. But I would say communication is much more than just speaking and writing. It refers to the ability to use language and nonverbal forms of communication in ways that are appropriate to the context, the communicative aims, and the medium, being it face-to-face -face or digital. It also involves things like active listening, empathy, turn-taking, and the use of respectful vocabulary. While it's not always possible for an activity to incorporate all of these features, there are a number of activity times that include at least some of them, as we'll see. In the classroom, we can develop our students' communication skills by, first of all, being a good example for them. Providing opportunities for learners to speak to others in order to feel more and more comfortable doing so. Allowing children to share thoughts and ideas in front of the class. And here are some ideas. Role plays, show and tell, where children can practice some sort of public speaking. Group presentations, which are the same thing of show and tell, but they're, do, they're done in groups. So children can also choose which part of the presentation to give, according to the one they feel more comfortable with. Interviews. Interviewing a friend could be quite different from interviewing the director of the school. Some tasks. First of all, the eye contact circle. Take a moment to read it. So eye contact is one of the basic principles of communication. And now that technology is everywhere in our lives, kids need to practice this. This is an easily adaptable task because kids can practice any kind of question. And it can help with classroom management since it requires students to be attentive to what's going on. Another task to practice communication is the pairs dictation, where kids have two different texts and they have to tell each other the missing words. This one encourages turn taking and active listening, giving children the opportunity to read aloud in a non threatening context. It is easily adaptable because we can do it with any kind of text and it is doable online. In fact, we found out this is one of the activity that works better online because children cannot cheat. They can't actually read each other text. Last one for this skill, pick an emotion. So two sets of cards, sentences and emotions for the emotion ones, the emoji are enough. In pairs, students pick a sentence, an emotion, and they try to read the sentence with that emotion. And the partner has to guess what the emotion is. This task focuses not only on what is said, but also on how. These two is adaptable. It allows practice of intonation. And maybe most importantly, it develops empathy. It lets students try and understand what other people's emotions are. Our fourth C is collaboration. Collaboration refers to the ability to work effectively with others towards shared goals. And I would say that whether kids are working with a soccer team to score a goal or are working with mates to complete a school project, they need to learn how to work with others. 
It requires individuals to demonstrate openness to learning from others, as well as to sharing their resources with others. It is a cornerstone of communicative ELT, which typically builds language skills through learners working together. It's a key feature of the tasks used in ELT to achieve communicative language goals, because these tasks involve using the language in meaningful, meaningful, authentic interaction. In this way, collaboration is both a process of language learning and an outcome. So what could encourage collaboration in the classroom? First of all, setting the task to be completed in pairs of groups. Although collaboration is not only throwing kids in groups, but also teaching them how to work well with others. Promoting a positive learning environment, creating a classroom that works as a team or community, and something as easy as referring to the environment as our classroom can make a difference. Some ideas, including children in making decisions, and we will see an example of this. Ideas, games, playing which children learn to wait for their turn, to achieve goals in teams, to ask for help, to help others. Group projects, although sometimes assessing such task becomes a bit tricky because sometimes one student completes all the work and others do little, relying on the stronger one. Well, if we assess both the final product and the collaboration involved, we could avoid such an issue. Storytelling, and we've had a great example, but also dealing with stories that, in which the characters have a task or a challenge and they have to work together to solve it. It's a good example of collaboration. Same thing with learning about the past. So finding out how others have worked together in the past. And interviewing people can be interviewing the adults on teamwork in their work. First example of task, the class contract, where we have things students agree on and things teacher agrees on. So in this case, students and teacher are working together towards a common goal. This task helps to promote a positive attitude to, uh, towards learning. And you'll see that if students make their own rules and agree on their own rules, they'll be more willing to adhere to them. We could work on collaboration through collaborative writing, which is something we usually link to older students or higher levels, but we can also do it with kids. We can just give a sheet of paper to a child, explain that they're going to write, for example, the description of a monster following a pattern. This is what we're aiming at. Well, the children should just write a line and then fold the paper. This is a fun and engaging task. We're dealing with monsters, so easy to engage children. It can be graded easily. It allows differentiation, because as you can see in the example, some children might answer with the old sentence, some other might just write notes like long legs. Last task for collaboration, the physical lineup, where children have to work together to find the right word order of a sentence. It's a kinesthetic activity and it's adaptable because it allows us to work with different target language. We can work on question word orders, negatives, adjective and nouns. Now, time for you to ask me some questions. So if you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A box.
see any questions. I'm pretty sure you've heard about this four C's before, because as I said, can we have a PDF of this? Sure you can, I'll share my slides with you. Okay, so to sum up what we've seen is that Developing soft skills can prepare our students for the challenges this century is asking us to face. They can be learned and taught. And language teachers are in a privileged position to do so. We can easily twist most of the tasks we already use in order to develop our students' creativity, critical thinking, communication and collaboration. Most of what we've seen today are common sense teaching skills that most of us do as second nature. However, thinking a moment and reflecting on them can allow us to focus on these skills in an intentional way. And I'd say it's never too late for us to start teaching and implementing these soft skills and it's never too early for our students to start learning them and developing them. So thank you. Here you can find some of the books I use when I run out of ideas. <laughs> another book to learn a bit more about soft skills and children. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Tiziana. I really liked the way um, you took activities that might be familiar to us and pointed out how actually we can use them intentionally um, to teach soft skills. I hadn't thought about that. So thank you very much.